Hello, everyone. This is Kate. I'm Caitlin Miller, your teen librarian here at Hewitt Public Library. And this is Tracy. She is our programming coordinator. Hey, guys. We're, we're so excited to have you here today. Um, I want to let you all know that there will be a question and answer segment at the end of the show. So if you have any questions throughout the performance, feel free to type them in the chat and we will um, do our best to get them answered at the end of the show. Um, so now I am happy to introduce someone we've had the honor of hosting before. He is a regular favorite here. We're glad to have him back today. Please give a nice welcome to Critter Man. Well, hello everybody. It's Critter Man, how are y'all doing? Hey, yeah, we're gonna have some fun today. We're gonna meet some amazing wild animals and uh, let's just hope we don't have any virtual messes. I don't think that's possible. Is that possible? I don't think that's possible. Anyways, yes, we're gonna meet uh, some amazing animals from all around the world and these are wild animals. Now, when I say wild animal, uh, that doesn't mean they're gonna jump through the camera and into your living room and try and eat one of you, no. Uh, uh, wild animal is an animal that's adapted or built for living out in the wild. They find their own food, their own water, and their own shelter, a place to live, of course. You know, when a wild animal gets hungry, it's not like they can cruise up to McDonald's to get a Happy Meal or something. So we're going to meet some wild animals. Now, I don't know what kind of animals you're hoping to see today. Let's just say that most of the animals that I'm going to share with you maybe are a little weird, a little different, a little creepy. Now, of course, I didn't bring, I'm not gonna bring any animal out to scare anyone. That's just a bonus, makes it more exciting. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the reason I like to share animals that are a little weird, a little different or creepy is because sometimes those animals do the most important things, at least for some of us, like people. Uh, so I thought that maybe if we meet some of those animals, you could understand them better. And hopefully that means you'll wanna do things to help protect all animals and the places that they live. Like the very first animal, which comes from South America, and her name is Rose, like the flower. See, Rose is one of the most beautiful animals in the world. Beautiful is even part of her name. She is called a Chilean beautiful tarantula. Now, one of the great things about the camera here, if it'll get into autofocus mode there, it was earlier, hold on there. I'm not focusing. Supposed to focus. Let's see if we can get it to focus here. Okay. So yeah, you can see she's climbing around on my hand there, but I don't think it's in autofocus right there. At least it's having a hard time focusing on her here. Yeah, maybe if I hold her right in front of me here. Now, of course, here's the thing. This, oh, you don't think she's beautiful, huh? Well, look at that pink hair. Come on, pink, beautiful. Well, that's where the name comes from. Now those pink hairs are also a warning to stay away because when a tarantula is in danger, she'll turn away from her enemy take one of these legs in the back here, or turn around there, and she'll kick the hairs off the abdomen, the big part in the back. If any of those hairs get kicked into the animal's face, it'll make them all itchy. Well, I don't think you'd want to eat something that makes you all itchy. So those hairs protect her from danger. And of course, that pink color is how she got her name beautiful. Now, what makes a lot of people nervous are the two teeth in the middle on the other side, two great big teeth called fangs. Now, here's the thing about spiders. Let's see if I can tilt her down there a little bit there. There we go. Yeah, you can see them right there in the middle. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's not focusing on here. Hold on here. Let me get in there. Let me rub that off there. We might have to check the lens there. It's supposed to autofocus on here so you guys can see better. Uh, the fangs are where the venom comes out of. Now, here's the thing. All spiders, are almost all spiders, are venomous. But that does not mean that they're almost all venomous to us, the people. But do spiders eat a lot of people? Uh, they don't eat any people. People, they eat bugs. That's their job. Yeah, and how many of you want to eat bugs? Yeah, there's always one of you raising your hand saying you'll eat bugs. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have dinner with you if you're eating bugs. Her job of catching and eating bugs is so important that she doesn't just have venom to help her catch those bugs. She can also spin something called a web. Now, they don't shoot the web out of the wrist like they're Spider-Man and go flying around town. They pull the web out from the back. There are those two things that are kind of folded up called spinnerets. You can see them right there. And they pull the web out. Now, one of the reasons I have my lights here is so you can actually see the web. Hold on here. There we go. Hold on. Aha, there we got it. Now you can see it nice and clear. That is her web. Now, spider web doesn't look very strong when you're looking at it, but one strand of spider web is five times stronger than a piece of steel, the same thickness. 
and it's sticky. Now, even though that's true, tarantulas are big spiders. They don't make webs that they walk on. She can't lower herself down out of a tree with her web. So instead, she'll spin her web inside a hole. Then if she catches a bug and she doesn't want to eat it right away, she'll pull it into the hole, stick it in the web, and store it for later, doing the job that spiders are built to do, which is not eating people. People, her job is eating bugs. Nature's pest control, the Chilean beautiful tarantula. That is Rose. Now, I want to make sure that we have the best virtual experience possible here. So I'm going to check something really quick, hopefully without making everybody dizzy. So you're just going to look at the, uh, an old, old picture of me and one of our animals there for just a second. Why I check this and make sure that is it, it's in focusing. Hold on here. Okay, let's try that. All right, we're going to turn that back on and we're going to see if we get continuous focusing a little bit better. That's still a little blurry. I'm not sure there. That or my hand is blurry. Okay, well, we'll try that. That's, I tried it. It's on continuous focusing, so it's doing what's supposed to do. Anyways, you know, that spider looks uh, kind of creepy to a lot of people. But remember, she doesn't look the way they, that she does to scare you or to impress you. She looks the way uh, she does because it helps her to do her job of eating bugs. Now, of course, every animal has some form of defense, some way of protecting themselves from danger. We're going to meet next an animal that's found right here in Texas that has a great form of defense. His name is CJ, and CJ brings his house with him everywhere he goes. This is CJ, and he is called a Texas Tortoise. Now I know some of you might have said turtle, you know. Here's the thing. No, he's a tortoise. And no, it's not like, you know, tomato, tomato, turtle, tortoise. I mean, they're not like, you know, the same same thing, right? You know, tomato and tomato, that's two different ways of talking about one thing. Turtles and tortoises are different animals. See, if CJ here were a turtle, he'd probably have webbed feet, flippers, fins, things to help him swim. Tortoises, though, they're very heavy. They have round legs and sharp claws. He does not swim, he lives on the land. But not just any land. A true tortoise, like CJ here, they can live on some of the driest land on earth, places like the desert. Now I said he brings his house with him ever ago, so where's his house? Oh yeah, <laughs> his shell. The shell is like the walls of a house. It's hard, it's armor. It's there to protect him from an animal shark teeth. Oh, that's right, that's right, that, yeah. Oh, you didn't see that coming, huh? Yeah, that shell is very hard. Now, even though a shell is incredibly hard, whenever I touch him, I always touch him very gently because this shell is part of his body. He does not have a whole closet full of these things. He doesn't strap it in the morning and go fight crime like a mutant turtle. No, his backbone, his spine is actually attached to the inside of the shell. Where's your backbone? I'll give you a hint, it's in your back. Yeah. Well, you can't take your backbone out and show it to your friends, can you? I don't think so. And a tortoise can never leave their shell. It grows and gets bigger as he does. Now you can actually touch something right now that's made out of the same stuff as a tortoise shell. Scan at the ends of your fingers and toes. Yeah, feel your fingernails. The same stuff that makes our fingernails hard is what makes a tortoise shell hard as well. His shell grows in layers and stacks that gets thicker and stronger as he gets older. And speaking of getting older, well, CJ is 25 years old, but he can live 50 to almost 200 years. He could do that even living in a desert, as long as he can find three things, food, water, and shelter. Now I know you're thinking, wait a minute, Critterman, come on, shelter, he's got his house with him. Well, yeah, I call the shell his house, but his shell doesn't have heating or air conditioning. <laughs> it gets very hot and very cold in the desert. But if a tortoise ever does get too hot or too cold, there's a reason they have sharp claws, he will dig. Yeah, if he burrows about eight to 10 inches under the ground, he'll never get too hot or cold. Now, food and water, that's a little bit trickier for CJ. Lucky for him, he's an herbivore, a plant-eating animal. And there is a plant that will grow in the desert that he can eat, although I wouldn't want to. It's kind of sharp and prickly. That's right, cactus. He's got a beak like a bird to bite off, a chunk of cactus. Hard bones in his mouth to smash the spikes of the cactus. He can eat the cactus leaf for food, and inside that cactus is water. It seems like that's about as close as it wants me to get there. Yeah. Well, guess what? A tortoise never has to take a drink of water his entire life. As long as he can find enough green plants to eat, even cactus, he can live and survive in the desert. And that is CJ, 
the Texas tortoise, bringing his house with him everywhere he goes. Well, now we're going to travel to Madagascar. Now, when I say Madagascar, I'm not talking about the movie Madagascar. Oh, no. I'm talking about the island of Madagascar. See, I could not be talking about the movie because the two animals that I'm going to share with you that come from Madagascar were not in any of the movies called Madagascar. Oh, so they both should have been for different reasons. Like this first animal should have been in at least one of those movies, movies because it was the first famous animal from Madagascar. Yeah, this, this animal, uh, these kind of animals have been in movies for a very long time. And this animal is also the biggest of its kind in the world. Big is even part of his name. Yes, his name is Kubwa Madudu. Now, are some of you laughing at his name? I don't know what's so funny about his name. See, Kubwa means big. He is a big Madudu. Really? Come on. No, no, it's not doo-doo. I did not bring a big doo-doo out to share with you. No, it's pronounced mud-doo-doo. Kubwa mud-doo-doo. See the difference? Kubwa means big and mud-doo-doo means bug. Hold on here. I got to get them right up in the camera there. There we go. Yes. Now, that is a cute little Madagascar hissing cockroach that you're looking at. And yes, he is little. One day he'll grow to be about as long as my hand, about that long, and about that wide, right there. Yeah, about that wide. He'll get a whole lot bigger. Now, here's the thing. Some people think this bug is gross and disgusting. Can you believe that? Wait a minute. How many of you said yes? Yeah. Well, he's really no different than a ladybug in every single way. Hey, if a ladybug landed on you right now, would he go, oh, get out, get out, get out, get out. Wait, would he do that? Would he freak out? Well, you would, even if you know it's a ladybug. Well, here's the thing. This bug is no different than a ladybug in every single way. First of all, when I'm touching him, I'm not touching skin. Bugs do not have skin. The outside of an insect is called an exoskeleton. Yeah, some of you knew that, right? Exo means outside. So his skeleton is on the outside. Our skeleton is on the inside. But a ladybug skeleton is on the outside. So why doesn't he look like a ladybug? They shop at different stores. I made that up. No, they don't. No, it has to do with where they live. Where this bug lives on the island of Madagascar, they live up in trees. There's all sorts of animals that live there that would love to eat a bug like this. Birds, lizards, monkeys that like to move it, move it. They love to eat them, eat them. Well, think about that. If you were bugs living up in the trees and there's animals trying to find you to eat you, would you want to be bright red with big black polka dots? No. His colors help him to hide, blend in, or camouflage. Now, as he's sitting on my hand, you can't see all of his body parts because, of course, he's got them tucked underneath. See, all you really see is the exoskeleton. You can't even see the head right now because these bumps that you might be able to see right there are not actually eyes. Those are just horns. That's how I know it's a he. See, you can tell that he's an insect, though, by looking at the legs, although he's got a piece of his bedding stuck underneath there. Hold on. What's that? There we go. There we go. Yeah, he's got a lot of hairy legs. And of course, he's got these two things sticking out the top of his head. See if you can see them there. Oh, there they are. The antenna. You can see the antenna. Yeah. Look at that's the best part. Let's see. Oh, come on. I wish we could get a close up of that. Come on, camera focus. That's the best part right there. Yeah. He's got six hairy legs and he's got antenna. Now, first of all, antenna are really amazing things. He can do four things with his antenna he can feel, hear, smell, and taste all with those antennas. How many of those things can you do with your antenna? Oh yeah, you don't have antenna. Yeah, so that's why they're so amazing. Four of our five senses with two things sticking at the top of the head. And of course, all those hairy legs. Oh yes, we love the hairy legs. He has six hairy legs. How many hairy legs does a ladybug have? The same number, six hairy legs. Those six hairy-like legs help him to do something very important. They help him to climb even upside down. Now, of course, he better not let go when he's upside down in a tree because there's one big difference between this bug and a ladybug. It's what they each will do first when they're in danger. You know what a ladybug will do first when they're in danger? Fly away, they have wings. He has no wings. So he has two choices. He can run or he'll make a loud sound like a snake. 
And the reason he hisses like a snake is because he is at the bottom of the food chain. He's an herbivore, plant-eating animal. The biggest predators in Madagascar are large snakes. They're at the top of the food chain. Those large snakes hunt animals that are in the middle of the food chain that are hunting him, like birds and lizards and monkeys that move it, move it, called lemurs, like King Julian from the movie Madagascar. That was a lemur, right? So you might think this is the most disgusting thing you've ever seen in your life. Well, that's okay because everyone's entitled to their opinion. But here's what's not an opinion. What is a fact is that there's a lot of animals that you probably think are cute that do not exist if they don't have food to eat. Food which often includes bugs like the Madagascar hissing cockroach. Kubwamadudu, which means big bug, a big bug indeed. That's the Madagascar hissing cockroach. Now, of course, there were no Madagascar hissing cockroaches in any of the movies called Madagascar. What uh, does they, mute mean? They were, uh, they were using no, uh, them in a lot of movies a long time ago. No, uh, things like uh, Indiana Jones, for instance. Now, of course, the next animal that I'm going to share with you is also not in any of the movies Madagascar. And this animal should have been in one of those movies because this is the toughest animal in all of Madagascar. That's right. This animal is so tough that not even if a 400 pound lion crash landed with his friends, the giraffe, the zebra, the hippo, and the penguin, would any of them dare mess with this animal? That's how tough he is. By the way, there are no lions, giraffes, zebra, hippos, or penguins living in the wild on the island of Madagascar. Yeah, if you saw the movie, they were in a boat. They were shipwrecked. They crashed. They're not actually from Madagascar. Uh, there are penguins in Africa, by the way, but they're found on the mainland in South Africa, not on the island of Madagascar. Well, none of those animals, not even the lion, would mess with my friend, Niachi. Yeah, that's his name. It's an awesome name. See, Niachi means leave me alone. Well, I don't think you have to say it angrily or yell or anything like that. But yeah, it means leave me alone. So would you like to meet the toughest animal in all of Madagascar? Wait, some of you said yes. Well, aren't you worried about my safety? <laughs> what do you mean, no? It's, sure, you're on the other side of the camera there. You know, so you're not afraid of anything. You got just all these miles of air between us where the signals are. Boy, this is like crazy that they, you can see me right now and we're not even in the same room. Yeah, which is why you're not worried about my safety, I guess. Okay, well, you know what they always say safety first. Yes. Oh, wait, this is a glove. I'd say, yeah, some of you are yelling out animal names. No, no this, this is a glow. That's for my safety, right? You know, some people think that the lion is the um, king of beasts. But this animal? Gotta get him. Oh, I see him. He's right down there. He makes the lion look like a wimp. Oh, sorry. Here he is, the true king of beasts. This is... Niachi. What do you mean cute? Him? He's not cute. Uh, no, he's not. Nuh-uh. Nuh-uh. Okay, I didn't want to do this to you because you're all rookies at home. Here's how you win an argument. Nuh-uh, infinity. Yes, I win. Now, listen here, Buzz Lightyear. There's nothing beyond infinity. You can't add something to infinity or multiply infinity. Infinity means uh, something that never ends. I mean, go look it up at the library if you don't believe me. That's right. You can fact check me. Okay. See, you guys don't care. It's like you still think he's cute. Okay. I get it. So maybe I should explain. Let's imagine we're on the island of Madagascar right now and that it's nighttime. This is an important fact because my friend Miachi is nocturnal, which means he's normally awake at night. Now imagine there's trees all around us. That's where he lives and that I am a predator like a fusa. <sighs> you know, sharp teeth and claws. And I'm out hunting. A fusa? Oh, a fusa is a cat-like animal that's not related to the cat, that's related to the mongoose, that looks nothing like a mongoose, that, well, it's an animal that's only found on the island of Madagascar, much like my friend Niachi here. Yes, yeah, so yeah, if you saw some of the Madagascar movies, you may have seen some fusa or fossa. Yeah, that is the same animal, by the way. Okay, so I'm a fusa, and I'm out hunting, and I see me actually sneaking through the trees. Well, I'm a predator. 
I'm not afraid of anything. So I sneak right up to Niachi. But before I pounce on top of him, tear him to pieces and eat him, you know what the predator, the Fusa, would do first? Smell him. Well, when he feels the breath from a predator's nose, he'll stop moving. He'll hold these 2,000 spikes straight up. He can move them. He'll spread them out. They'll become sharp like needles. And at the last second, he will jump about that high. Yes, that high. He's not Superman. He can't fly. I mean, come on, people. No. But what if he jumps that high when the predator's nose is about that close? Guess what's going to happen? Yeah, he's going to stab him in the face. Well, would you eat dinner if it jumped up off the table and stabbed you in the face? How many of you said, what do you mean, yes? What are you having for dinner that's so good? Hey, I like fresh food, but not if it's still running around my plate, let alone stabbing me. I draw the line there. Well, see, that's what makes this animal so tough. He's got these spikes to defend himself wherever he goes. It's not just armor like the tortoise for defense. When he's in danger, he can use it for offense. Give him a little poke, and it usually works. Now, because this animal has pokey hair, a lot of people think that my friend Niachi is a hedgehog or a porcupine. Those are the two guesses we usually get, right? Well, first of all, porcupines are herbivores. They eat plants. They have two teeth in the middle that never stop growing. Porcupines are related to rats and mice. This animal is an insectivore. An insectivore eats insects. They eat bugs. Hedgehogs have pokey hair and hedgehogs are insectivores, right? But this animal is not a hedgehog because my friend Niachi can do something that a hedgehog cannot do. It's why I'm wearing the gloves. He can climb trees, even upside down. Now, of course, because he can climb trees upside down and he's covered in spikes, which means that he's not afraid of any predators, definitely not afraid of the fusa, Oh, and also not afraid of the animal at the top of the food chain, those big snakes. See, snakes have to swallow their food whole. Could you imagine swallowing an animal covered in spikes whole? I don't think that's going to work out. See, he truly is the toughest animal in all of Madagascar, tougher than even a large snake or predator like a fusa. And you might say that this animal is really important because I think that a lot of you thought he was cute. By the way, whoever said you can't be cute and tough at the same time. But remember I said that we don't have cute little lemurs if they don't have food teeth like the Madagascar hissing cockroach? Well, you're looking at an animal that is especially adapted or built for hunting and eating Madagascar hissing cockroaches because he can climb trees even upside down and find them. He doesn't depend on his eyesight, so the color of the insect is not important. He has an excellent sense of smell so he can smell them wherever they are. And by the way, the one form of defense that the Madagascar hissing cockroach has is to hiss like a snake, which might work if the animal were afraid of snakes. But my friend Niachi is not. See this animal, he's got its very own name, not a porcupine, not a hedgehog. The toughest animal in all of Madagascar is called a tenric. And if you knew that, well, that means either you do a lot of reading, which is impressive, or maybe you saw it on that TV show, The Wild Crap, because they did a whole episode about the Tenrix of Madagascar, the toughest animal from the island of Madagascar, the true king. Ladies and gentlemen, Niachi, the Tenrix. Yes, a very cool animal. Well, now I want to share with you an animal that has something in common with the tarantula. Not a lot of legs. No, that's not what they have in common. What this animal has in common with the tarantula is that when a lot of people see this animal, they get nervous and scream. Oh yeah, there's some animals that just make some people scream. That's right, maybe some of your moms, <laughs> maybe a lot of your dads. Yeah, I found a lot of dads are more nervous about these animals than moms are. Well, here's the thing. This animal is not an animal to fear, just an animal to respect. His name is Arthur. This is an animal that's found right around where you live here in Texas, and he's called a speckled king snake. Now, a lot of people don't care about what kind of snake this is because as far as they're concerned, the only good snake is a, did anybody in the room just say dead snake by any chance? Yeah, maybe if your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa are watching with you today. Well, if they said that, 
don't be upset. Uh, they said that because they heard that when they were growing up. As a matter of fact, a lot of adults were taught that, that the only good snake is a dead snake. Well, I can promise you this. If you're taught that something's not good, it's not important, then you're never going to care about it and want to protect it. Snakes are one of the most important animals on the planet for humans. That's right. See, first of all, snakes like my friend Arthur here eat a lot of rodents like rats and mice. You want to eat rats and mice? I shouldn't have asked that question. I knew some of you would say yes. Yeah, well, rats and mice, well, do you know what they eat? No, not cheese. They don't have their own little cows to make their own cheese. No, most rats and mice eat a lot of plants, like farmers' crops, which is our food. Well, do you like to eat food? Do you like pizza? Do you like cake? Well, no pizza or cake without snakes. As a matter of fact, we have more food to eat because of snakes, because snakes do not eat farmers' crops. They eat the animals that are eating farmers' crops. That makes them pretty important. Now, of course, I can tell people that all day long, and they just don't care because they can't stand the way a snake looks. You can see Arthur here is really on the move today, isn't he? Yeah, a lot of people think that if you touch a snake, it would feel all wet and slimy. Well, snakes are not slimy or wet. I mean, if you have something that's made out of sequins or glitter around the house, is it wet? No, but it's shiny, right? So things that are very smooth reflect light. A snake scales like this one, in some cases, are so smooth that they reflect light, making them look shiny. And of course, every time a snake eats, they grow. Whenever they grow, they get too big for their old skin, and something happens, they will shed. So they're always getting brand new skin. Now, of course, if you ever have an opportunity to touch a snake, not a wild one, by the way, uh, but if I come uh, to visit you all in person, the next year at the Hewitt Public Library, well, or somebody else brings one, uh, if you touch a snake, well, if it feels slimy to you, what you're going to have to do is take your hand, dry it off, and try touching again. Because you know what happens to human hands? We get nervous, excited, or hot. They sweat. So if you've ever touched a snake and it felt slimy, hate to break this to you, but you were the slimy one, not the snake. Now, the last thing people tell me they don't like about snakes, and I can appreciate this, they can never tell if they're venomous or not. Is this a venomous snake? Yeah, a lot of you said no. Is that just because I'm holding it? Yeah, don't go based on that. You know, it's not always easy to tell if a snake is venomous. And you can't just learn three things to identify every snake in Texas, let alone the planet, right? Some of you may have heard to look at the shape of the head, right? If it's a triangle-shaped head, they tell you it's a venomous snake. The problem with that is some of the most venomous snakes on the planet actually have round heads, like uh, mambas, sea snakes, and coral snakes. So be careful about just looking at the shape of the head, because there's two snakes in Texas that have very pointy heads, the bull snake and the hognose snake. And because they have pointy, triangle-shaped looking heads, a lot of people kill them, even though they have no venom. So you can't just look at the shape of the head. Then they'll tell you a poem, right? Red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow can kill a fellow. Boy, that's a fun poem, isn't it? Well, here's the thing. You're only supposed to use that poem uh, with a snake that has all three colors, and you're looking for stripes, not just the colors, and it only works north of the equator. So I don't know how well a poem is going to help you. And then the third thing they tell you, and that is to look at the eyes. And when they say that, they actually mean the pupils. Well, I don't know if any of your parents or grandparents are in the room watching with you right now, but this is not a good way to identify a venomous snake because in order to see the pupils of most snakes, you would have to get your face about as close as Arthur's face is to me right now. And that is not a good way to tell if a snake is venomous or not. So I have something much easier to remember that'll always keep you safe. And that is if you ever come across a snake or any wild animal, please leave them alone. Because if you don't, the animal might be afraid of you, right? And even if it's an accident, you accidentally get too close to them, they don't know that and they might bite. So leave them alone. And by the way, don't ever try and kill a venomous snake. Do you know that about half the people that get bitten by venomous snakes, they're bitten while they're trying to kill the venomous snake. So please leave them alone. And by the way, you never want to hurt or kill a king snake. Yeah, look at that pattern there, those speckles. A speckled king snake. It looks like he's got freckles almost. Well, the speckled king snake is called a king snake, not because he's married to a queen and fights dragons with swords and lives in a castle, 
That would be cool though. No, the reason they call them a king snake and the reason you never want to hurt one is because king snakes do not just eat rats and mice. Many king snakes also have the ability to hunt and eat and kill venomous snakes, like rattlesnakes, copperheads, cotton mouse, and coral snakes. So if you're not a big fan of snakes, you're, it's probably because of the venomous ones, well then you'd never want to hurt a king snake. That is how, how they earn their royal title. And this one here, which is found right around where you live, is called a speckled king, king snake. And that is Arthur the King Snake. Get it, Arthur the King Snake? Okay, maybe you did. Hey, let's say goodbye to Arthur. Now, every single animal that I brought up today, well, does something that's important. And I think that it's, you know, really valuable to meet and learn about animals in many different ways. Because when you learn about animals, like I said at the beginning, hopefully you'll uh, understand them better. And if you understand them better, then hopefully that means you'll want to do things to help protect them and the places that they live. And if you stop when you see a wild animal and leave them alone and be quiet, you might be surprised at how much you can learn about an animal just by watching them. Because, you know, you can see how the animal moves. You might be lucky enough to actually see the animal catch something and eat something, right? Which is kind of fascinating. It tells you what kind of food an animal eats. And if you look close enough at the way the animals put together at their body parts, well, that gives you many hints as to what kind of animal you're looking at and where they spend most of their time. Well, I tell you that because this last animal that I'm going to share with you comes from Turkey, uh, the country of Turkey, not the bird, just so we're clear. And his name is Legs. This is Legs from Turkey. And no, this is not another snake. This it's called a giant legless lizard or a glass lizard. Now, I know some of your parents are thinking, wait a minute, the library got this guy to come to a program and he can't even identify a snake. He doesn't know anything about animals. No, this is not a snake. <laughs> Honest truth, this is a legless lizard. And there are many things that make him a lizard instead of a snake. Now, the first thing is something that you can't really see very easily, and that would be his tail. I want you to imagine that my friend Legs is moving along the forest floor and he's looking for food to eat. When along comes some big hungry animal, reaches down, grabs him by the tail here, picks him up and tries to eat him. He's a goner then, right? No, he's not. He could escape. Because if an animal picks him up by his tail, do you know what'll happen to the tail? It'll fall off. Now, would that be good if someone grabbed your hand and pulled and your arm and fell off? No, that would not be good. You cannot grow back a whole new arm. Many lizards have this ability to drop part or all of their tail off to get away from danger. And it's okay because then they can escape with all the important parts and after a while they can regenerate or regrow a whole new tail or a good part of one anyways. So there are no snakes in the world that can do that. That's the first reason this is not a snake, he's a lizard. Now, here's the thing. It might be difficult to tell where his tail starts, but if you're looking very carefully, there's some hints. First of all, you see that line in the side of his body, right? That line is actually a fold of scales. It's a fold of scales that moves up and down. It allows him uh, an ability to stretch out and get a deep breath of air. So it allows him to breathe earlier and for his lungs to work better. But right at the end of where that line starts is where the tail begins. But it's not because of where the line is. It's this thing underneath that's called the vent. It's little curved scales underneath there. Uh, and by the way, I'm not going to get too detailed in what a vent is. Let's just say for the parents at home, it's the universal exit for reptiles. I'll leave it to you if you want to explain more. Now, anyways, that's where the tail starts. And his tail starts right up there. Well, by the way, most lizards' tails are as long or longer than their body. Pretty cool. Now, even though he can lose his tail, he doesn't want to. See, the tail helps the legless lizard move through the world faster. If I set him on the ground, he slithers like a snake. If I put him in the water, the tail works like a paddle to help him swim. He can even do something that seems impossible. He can climb trees. Now, how many of you could climb a tree without using your hands or arms or feet or legs? Uh huh. you didn't let me finish. Yeah, and you can't use your ears to climb a tree. Uh, many lizards, right, uh, can climb trees with their legs. Of course they can but a legless lizard and snakes 
can also climb trees because the scales that are on the bottom part of their body often give them a little bit of a grip, almost sticks to the tree like a giant piece of Velcro. So he can climb trees. Now, here's the cool part. If you were walking along, hold on here. Hold on here, I don't know what that was. I had a musical interlude there. Okay, so this guy right here, well, if you were walking along and you came across this animal, you could tell that this is a lizard and not a snake just by looking at the head, if you know what to look for. First of all, on each side of his head, he's got a hole. You can probably see it right there. It's a very tiny little hole. That hole is his ears. Well, big deal, he's got ears in the outside of his um, head. Do you have ears in the outside of your head? You have to say, no, check again. They're on the side, maybe under your hair. Yeah. Do you know what kind of animal does not have holes for ears in the outside of their head? Snake. Snakes don't hear sound the way other animals do because they don't have holes like other animals to let the sound in. Snakes feel sound with their tongue, with their bones and their jaw. Now, the other thing you could look for that would give it away that he's not a snake, that he's a lizard, is watch what he does with his eyes when I rub the top of his head. Let's see if I can get him turned sideways there and give him a little rub on the head there. Are you gonna show him legs? You're not really cooperating right now. Oh, he got a little one there. They can blink. I don't know if he did it there. I'm trying to keep track. He's like, yes, hi there, hi there, yes. They can blink and snakes cannot blink because snakes have no eyelids. They have nothing to close. So if you're ever walking along and you come across a long scaly animal, with no legs and a wing statue, it's not a snake, it is a legless lizard. And this happens to be one of the world's biggest ones, the giant legless lizard or glass lizard. Yes, that's legs. You know, I've been doing all the talking during all of this and you all have been on, on mute, of course. And uh, that's just so that everybody can hear what I'm saying. But uh, what I'm gonna do before I wrap things up is I'm going to take some questions. Now, I think the way that this is probably gonna work best is if instead of uh, turning your uh, microphone on, if you can just put your questions into the chat, I'll take some questions before I wrap up here. And let's see here, I might see if maybe Tracy, if you could, um, unmute yourself and scroll through and see if there's any questions and then just read them to me so I don't have to stay in there and try and scroll through any of the questions. Now, while Tracy uh, uh, um, unmutes herself hopefully here and we get some questions. That's right, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Okay, we have our first question from Camp MCC and they wanna know why eels look so slimy. Well, of course, eels live in the water and eels, you know, have very smooth skin as well. So in the water, which water makes things look, look shinier as well because water reflects light. Uh, water, uh, light bounces off of water. And so when you're under the water and looking at an eel, much like the snake that has the smooth scales, eel skin is very smooth. Now that's not all eels. Some eels don't look all that shiny. It, it just depends on what species you're looking at. Yeah, that was a very good question. Next question, are there other species of legless lizards? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there are. We have legless lizards here in Texas, but they're not as big as that one. Most of the legless lizards that you're ever gonna see in Texas are only a couple of inches long and they're smaller around than my pinky. They're not very big. But if you look carefully at them, uh, you usually find them in gardens and places like that. If you look at the head carefully, you'll see the little hole on the side of the head. And if you watch them long enough, they'll blink. Now don't test out the tail theory though. They do need that tail. So don't pick them up because they you know, often can lose part of the tail. Okay, next question. Should you keep a pet as a snake or a snake as a pet? Well, you know, that's kind of a question for uh, each individual in their family. I will say that getting an animal, any animal as a pet, it's, it's a big responsibility. It's not like getting like a new toy or something like that that you're gonna play with for a little while and then put it on a shelf and not you know, ever play it again. Uh, because an animal is a living creature and they should become part of your family. Because when you take an animal to your home and you're going to care for them, well, they depend on you for their survival. 
right? Because they're no longer able to do those things out in the wild. So if you buy one from a pet store, remember they have, they still have to have food, water, and shelter. And if you're getting a snake, they have some very special needs. So I would say a couple of things. First, get, uh, do your homework, right? Go to the library and read. There's a lot of great books about snakes and how to take care of them properly as pets, what kind of light they need, what temperatures are best for each kind of snake. Um, but maybe the more important part is to make sure that everybody in the family wants the snake. Because I know you kids might want a snake, but if mom or dad don't want the snake, well, mom and dad, that's going to be a problem because guess who's probably going to end up caring for the snake most of the time? I know everybody has good intentions. <laughs> the kids say they'll clean up after them, but that doesn't always work out. So make sure if you get a snake as a pet that mom, dad, that you're willing to be the caretaker, the primary caretaker. And also remember, you can't go to the grocery store and buy a can of snake food. And that's right. They eat rodents, mice and rats. Yeah, you can get them frozen, but yeah, that's kind of weird when someone opens up the freezer, you get a popsicle out and there's a frozen mouse next to it. Next question. I think we have time for one more question and it's Perfect. how do snakes feel sound? Oh, so that's a good question. So how do they feel sound? Um, so if you're ever someplace where there's music playing, right? And you close your eyes. Well, if you concentrate, sometimes you can almost feel the music moving through your body. You can feel the vibrations. And of course, this is especially true if you turn up the music a little bit louder, then you can start to feel the vibrations. Um, in the car, if you put your hand down by the speaker, you can feel the vibrations. So sound, right, is sound waves. It moves to the air, even though you can't see it, it moves the air. And so when the snake sticks out their tongue, with their tongue, they can sense, they can feel the movement of the sound. They can feel the vibrations that sound make. Same thing with their bones, especially in their jaw. So if something's walking along, right? They can feel vibrations through, uh, through, through the ground. So even though they don't hear the sound like most of the animals do, they're feeling the sound, feeling those vibrations, giving them a, a slightly different form of hearing. Those are all great questions. Well, I'll tell you what, I know the librarians may have something they wanna wrap up with, but let me share one last thing with you. And that is if any of you here uh, at home uh, would ever like to learn more about any of the animals that I shared with you today, if you'd like to learn about some other animals we share the planet with and how they live and survive, um, if you'd like to find answers to questions, maybe questions that you're thinking of right now that you didn't get answered, or you think of a question later, well, there's this really cool place you can go to find answers to questions and to learn about animals from all around the world. The place that I'm talking about is absolutely free and it's filled with books. The library. Yeah, the library, reading can take you anywhere you want to go. Because when I was your age, I read about animals because I loved animals. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could work with animals? So I read about schools that I could go to so that I could work with animals, which meant then I was gonna read about jobs that I could do so I could work with animals. And really what I learned is that reading can take you anywhere you want to go. I should know because it did for me. Well, thank you all for joining us today, at least for me, Critterman. Thank you guys, and I hope to see you in person next year in 2022. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Critterman. We really enjoyed your show, and it was very informative. We learned a lot. Um, so a couple things happening next week at the library. So we will be closed next Monday to observe the 4th of July. So on Tuesday, our Butterfly Habitat Summer Kits will be available for pickup for those who have registered. Also on Tuesday, Doc McStuffins is going to be visiting the library from 10 to noon. So that's when you can stop by and take a picture with her. Next Wednesday at 10, we are having a virtual show with Lucas Miller, the singing zoologist. We're only about halfway through summer, so there's still plenty of activities left and there's plenty of time for summer reading. So if you haven't registered yet, Go ahead and register, and we hope you guys have a great rest of the week, and I hope you all have a happy 4th of July this weekend, all right? See ya. Come see us at the library. Bye.